In this lecture, we're going to talk about protecting yourself, your human capital, right? And specifically, we're going to focus on disability insurance, long-term care insurance, and health insurance. However, I want to remind you to keep in mind as we go through this, that even though we're talking about insurance throughout, that insurance is only one way to manage risk. As I talked about in the intro video to this unit, we can also avoid or transfer risk. Okay, we can retain some. We can reduce risk. We have other techniques that we can use. Okay, so when it comes to protecting your human capital, some alternative techniques might be um, slowing down so you're less likely to get in a car accident, uh, eating healthy, going to the gym, uh, Things like that to maintain your health can decrease the likelihood of you being disabled or needing to use your health insurance or otherwise losing your ability uh, to provide for yourself. So keep in mind that those techniques are also effective and should be used in an effective financial plan. Even though, you know, exercising and eating healthy, they don't really feel like financial decisions. They really are because they affect your financial situation and your ability to maintain your human capital. Now the first insurance we're going to talk about Now the first insurance we're going to talk about is disability insurance. And so our first question is, who needs disability insurance? And the answer to that is anyone who depends, who has a job and depends on that paycheck needs disability insurance. So if you ask yourself, All right, if I lost my job, would my life be financially worse? If the answer to that question is yes, then you need disability insurance. And clearly, that's almost everyone who has a job, right? Not a lot of people have jobs who don't need them. There are some. But for the most part, it's pretty much anyone who needs who has a job uh, needs disability insurance because you can be injured, you can be, have short-term disability, maybe you can't work for a month or two because you're recovering from a surgery. That's short-term disability. And if you lose your paycheck for three months, how much trouble are you going to be in? Potentially a lot, right? Depends on your emergency fund, how things are set up. So that's important. And so disability insurance is really, really important. Now, a lot of times you can get disability insurance through your employer's uh, benefits package. Sometimes you have to pay for it, sometimes not. It just depends on how the employer has it set up. So when you, before you accept a job, uh, look at the benefits package, see what it says about disability insurance. That said, even if they offer it or even if they don't, you can always go out and just buy your own disability insurance. Just Google shop for disability insurance and you can compare providers and get rates and find a policy that will give you the coverage that you want. Now a key point we need to make about disability insurance is they tend to fall into two broad categories. Okay? There's own occupation coverage and any occupation coverage. Own occupation coverage gives you coverage only if you can't work in the job that you were doing before you were disabled. Okay, so if I have an own occupation policy and I become disabled to where I can't be a professor anymore, uh, own occupation policy would pay. Now that's different from an any occupation policy, which provides coverage only if you can't work in any occupation to which you were reasonably suited. So I know any occupation sounds like it's kind of broad. You're like, oh, it covers any occupation, right? Any sounds like a broad term. But actually, any co occupation coverage gives you a much narrower and limited range of coverage than own occupation. Let me give you an example. So picture a world-class violinist, right? Maybe she plays for the London Philharmonic or something. That's a good job. Okay, Those, those musicians are very talented. They work very hard, and they get paid quite well. And her ability to earn that living is rest in her hands, right? Her ability to play that beautiful music. Let's say she gets into a car accident and her hand gets smashed. And she recovers, right? They patch her up, they do some surgeries, but she loses. She can still play violin, but it's just, you know, it's just not at that world-class level that it used to be. It just isn't. If she has an own occupation policy, that policy will pay her for her disability. Okay, It will compensate her a certain amount as defined inside the policy. 
once that event happens and she becomes disabled under the terms of an own occupation policy. However, if she has an any occupation policy, there's a good chance that she will not be able to claim benefits under her policy because she still could teach high school orchestra, for example. She's reasonably suited to teach high school orchestra because of her skills and experience. Therefore, that's an occupation she can still work in, and therefore she is not considered disabled under an any occupation policy. Okay, so even though her income is going to take a huge hit, she's going to lose a big chunk of her income as a result of this car accident, an any occupation policy is not likely to pay her, but an own occupation policy definitely would. So generally speaking, an own occupation policy is recommended. It's much more likely to pay out if you need it, and that's what you want it to do. If you actually become disabled, lose some ability to earn, you want it to pay. And own occupation is more likely to pay out than any. That does make it more expensive, though. So you need to think about your circumstances. There may be a situation where if you can't do anything you're suited to, then, yeah, you're... There may be jobs where that makes sense. So, for example, for a professor like me, if I can't teach at a university, then I probably can't teach at a high school either. And I probably can't work as a professional financial planner. So there's a good chance that if I become disabled, I won't be able to do any occupation reasonably suited. So for a professor, maybe an any occupation might make sense. But for most people, an own occupation needs to needs to uh, will provide better coverage and be be worth paying extra for now the details can vary okay? and they can vary a lot you're not likely to find a disability policy that actually says own occupation or any occupation you're going to have to read the details of the policy to figure out which type it is now when you buy your policy you're also going to want to pay attention to the waiting period Right, the payout period, how long will it pay? Short-term policies tend to pay for only a few months. Long-term policies can pay out over multiple years. So <clears throat> you need to read those, and the readings have information about what all those mean. But you need to go through the policy and look at it carefully and make sure you understand what it pays and under what circumstances it pays. Now, let's talk about long-term care insurance, okay? Long-term care insurance pays if you need to go into like a nursing home, an assisted living facility, or something like that. You need care for multiple years. And the question you need to ask yourself if you are asking, do I need long-term care insurance, is first, do you expect to live a long time? The best way to guess how long you're going to live is to look at how long your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents live. Okay, does your family have a history of living for a long time? Do you have underlying medical conditions that might say, you know, I'm more likely to die at 80 than 90? Um, or do you have other, you know, er other aspects of your medical condition that might indicate? It can be a little hard to say one way or another, but you need to make an assessment. The longer you expect to live, the more likely you are to need long-term care insurance. Okay. Now, long-term care insurance... Um, there's some, some nuance here. A lot of people think they look at how expensive long-term care is, and it is expensive. Uh, last time I checked, the average nursing home facility in North Carolina cost about $60,000 a year. And if you want a really nice place, it goes up from there really fast. And most people are like, I don't even make $60,000 a year now. How am I going to afford to pay that $60,000 a year when I'm 65 or 70 or 75, right, when I'm actually using this policy. Well, it's true that these facilities are very expensive. There are a couple of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about long-term care insurance. It's actually not quite as essential as it may seem. So I want you to think, think about it. I'm not telling you not to buy long-term care insurance. It actually can be really good if you can afford it. But let's think about it in a more comprehensive way. First off, the average stay in long-term care facilities tends to be pretty short. It can vary significantly depending on the type of facility, but usually one or two years is about it, right? You're not in a long-term care facility because you're in very good health. 
And so most of the time, people who use these facilities are not in there for particularly long. So $60,000 a year for 15 years, yeah, that's a huge amount of money. But for two years, it's much more manageable. And if you prepared for your retirement adequately, you may be able to cut you may be able to cover that. Second thing to keep in mind though, is if you're moving into a long-term care facility, you probably don't need your home anymore, right? If there's somebody in the home who could take care of you living in the home, you would just stay at home. Most people would far prefer that, right? So there's going to be a good chance that if you need long-term care, then you're not going to need the house. And so you can sell the house and get a good chunk of money that could cover one, two, three years worth of worth of uh, care in these facilities. And so you may be able to, uh, that may be a good option. Instead of long-term care insurance, you just plan on selling the house if it becomes necessary. Again, it may not always work out. There may be people in the home who could take care of you, but you move out for whatever reason. Right? But think about that as an option. A lot of times the home does become available to sell or to take a reverse mortgage on and access its value in order to pay for the long-term care insurance. Okay, the last thing to think about is that if you're in a long-term care facility, then that's your only expense. You're not traveling, you're not buying groceries, you don't need gas, right? You probably don't have health insurance because you're probably on Medicaid, right? So aside from maybe buying Christmas and birthday presents for the great grandkids, that's about all your expenses. And so so many of your other expenses fall away. It helps offset the cost of the facility. Again, it probably won't offset it completely because they are expensive. But if you think about through these different uh, aspects, right, your expenses decline, you could probably sell the house and you're probably not going to be there for very long. Long-term care insurance starts to not seem quite as vital, quite as essential. That said, it can still be a very useful part of a plan very helpful to have uh, because it protects you if you don't fall right we I said probably a short stay probably you can sell the house and you're probably your expense is going to drop considerably but probably is not definitely and so long-term care insurance can help you take care get rid of that uncertainty you're like wow I'm probably safe but that's small consolation if you happen to be the one person who needs a 20-year stay in long-term care the fact that you beat the odds to be that person are not going to make you feel a lot better. If you want to buy long-term care insurance, the ideal time is somewhere in your mid-50s. Any younger, and you're going to be paying for it when you really, it's real, the risk of needing long-term care younger than 55 is very low. So you're going to be paying for a policy for a long time over a period of time when you, you're really, the odds of needing it are extremely low. But the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. And so if you wait until after 55, it starts to be more and more expensive per year to pay for the insurance premiums. And so research and studies have found that somewhere in your mid-50s is about the ideal spot where it keeps the cost low and minimizes the number of years that you're paying for it. So when you get to your 50s, start thinking about it and looking at your financial situation, how much money you have saved for retirement, where you expect to end up, and how likely you feel you are to need it. All right, let's talk about health insurance then. The readings cover most of the basic things we want to cover here. So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is a little bit of the political landscape of healthcare and why things are the way they are and where they look like they're going. So. Uh, the Affordable Care Act changed quite a few things in health insurance. And so what I'm going to talk about here is changes that the Affordable Care Act made, the rationale behind them, and how effective they may or may not have been. Okay, The first thing the Affordable Care Act changed is that it could not, it made it illegal to exclude people from a health insurance policy. Now, there used to be a thing called pre-existing conditions. So, for example, my dad had a heart attack. Uh, after that, he was scared to lose his insurance because if he lost his insurance coverage and then tried to get onto a new policy after that, his heart um, 
His heart disease would be considered a pre-existing condition and a new policy could refuse to cover him because of his health heart condition. Okay, That's a pre-existing condition. That's not an issue anymore. The Affordable Care Act got rid of that. So now they can't say, nope, you're not allowed on the policy. Now what's the reason for excluding someone like my dad from a health insurance policy? Well, people with pre-existing conditions tend to have expensive medical bills, right? So the way insurance policies work is let's say you have a hundred people in your little town. They each chip in a thousand dollars to the insurance policy and premiums every year. So for the year you have a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, right? Income for the health insurance policy. Let's say two people get sick that year and they each have twenty-five thousand dollars worth of medical bills the insurance policy will dip into our pool of one hundred thousand dollars and pay those two people back their twenty five thousand dollars so what's happened is let's say i paid in my thousand dollar premium but i didn't have any medical expenses my thousand dollars have gone to support somebody who did need it right and if you're the one who needs it you don't get crushed by this twenty five thousand dollar debt you just paid your thousand dollar premium and you're good so what we're doing is we're sharing risk rather than all of us holding on to our own money and praying that we're not the ones who need it. We're not the ones who are going to have medical expenses. We don't have to worry. We just pay the thousand. We know how much it is. We can budget for it. We pay it. And then if we have an issue, we're okay. That's the basic idea of how a health insurance policy works. We all pool our money together and then the people who are sick, who need to go get medical services can do so without being financially destroyed. Well, the problem is if you want to bring someone into that policy and you know, look, there are our premiums are only a thousand dollars a year. And this guy's had fifteen thousand dollars a year in medical expenses every year of his life. Do you want to bring him into your policy? If you do, it's going to raise costs and you're going to have to pay more out of your own pocket just because this guy came in on the policy. Okay, so covering those conditions makes the policy more expensive, less affordable for everyone else. And so there's a trade-off. Okay? You have the practical consideration. You can't just cover your expenses and expenses and expenses endlessly. The more pre-existing conditions you let into a policy, the more expensive it's going to be and the greater the burden on everyone else. But then there's the other side of, you know, who are the people who need health insurance the most? Who need this help the most? It's the people with large medical bills. And so if you can exclude them, then you're denying coverage to the people who need it the most. Those are kind of the two sides of the argument. And they have to be balanced. You can't just ignore costs, but you know, to deny the people who actually need medical coverage and medical protection, that coverage seems unfair and unkind. So, right, where do we strike that balance? Well, the Affordable Care Act said no longer, nobody can be excluded. You have to let them into the policy. That virtually guarantees that the cost of health insurance will go up. And that's part of the Affordable Care Act. Now, the other thing is that they can't base your premium on your health. So it used to be, you know, my dad, let's say he did find a policy that would let him in despite his heart condition. They would simply charge him more because he's more expensive, right? He brings more medical bills, so he needs to pay more into the policy. The Affordable Care Act got rid of that. So now the only thing that they can use to change how much they charge you is how old you are, how big your house is, whether or not you use tobacco, and where you live, okay, what your cost of living looks like. Those are the only things. And so now, after the Affordable Care Act, my dad doesn't have to worry about losing his insurance, and he doesn't have to worry about being charged an amount of money that he cannot afford. That's how that helps him. But again, just like not excluding people, that increases costs to insurance. And so, so far, there are two aspects of the Affordable Care Act that both 
are compassionate, they're extending coverage and helping the people who need coverage the most get it, which is a good thing. But those two things also are going to increase costs of health insurance. And those that's a bad thing, right? We don't want our health insurance to be more expensive. So the Affordable Care Act, the whole point is to try to make health care affordable, right? So far, not doing so great on that front. Um, something else that it did to try to maintain, uh, try to push down costs, is that you didn't have to be employed to maintain coverage. So it used to be you would get insurance through your employer, and that was basically it. Uh, you couldn't get it on your own. And so if you lost your job, or you left your job to start a business, or you wanted to retire early, you wouldn't have any health insurance coverage. So the Affordable Care Act changed that. and Maybe you can get that coverage. And that should push prices down, maybe just a little bit, because it increases the number of people in the pool. We're spreading out. Yes, we have more expenses because we can't exclude pre-existing conditions and we can't charge more to people based on their health. That pushed the price up. This will pull the price down by spreading it out among more people. Starting in 2014, everyone has to have health insurance coverage. This is the Affordable Care Act's big effort to keep prices down. So if we're going to bring in people with expensive health conditions, put them onto the policies, that'll push prices up. If, though, we bring more people into the insurance policies, yes, we'll have higher costs, but we can spread it out among more people. And this should push prices down considerably. So this is the primary way that the Affordable Care Act tried to push prices down and cost of insurance down. However, in 2019, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed. And while it sounds like that's a bill to reduce taxes, which it did, it also repealed the mandate. So now no one is, not everyone is required to have health insurance. And that was the one thing that the Affordable Care Act had that was really pushing prices down. So when we get rid of that, personally, it seems like prices will only have to go up and cost of insurance will have to go up unless we do something else, unless we make another change. Now, lastly, one of the best things that the Affordable Care Act did was create health care exchanges. So this is where you can go and you can buy health care. This did not exist before the Affordable Care Act, so it's relatively new historically. The health care exchanges were meant to be places where insurance companies could post their policies and people could, if they didn't like the policy offered by their employer or they didn't have one available, they could go buy one there. And it's really nice because it sets up it shows you side by side all the different policies, how much they cost, what kind of coverage they give you. This didn't exist before. If you wanted to compare health insurance policies before the healthcare exchanges, you'd have to go to one insurance company, fill out their form, get a medical checkup, and then they'll send you a quote. And so if you wanted to compare six different policies, you'd have to fill out six different forms wait and do six different medical exams and then wait again while they while they processed it and sent you the information back it just was not feasible to comparison shop insurance policies so the healthcare exchanges were a really good idea a, a way to let consumers shop for policies and it really is a way to capture the power of a free market because then the consumers can compare products and price compare See, before that, I couldn't, the effort to compare the prices of multiple policies was just, it just was not feasible. I mean, people just didn't, didn't do it. It was just too hard. Too hard. Well, the healthcare exchanges changed that. The problem, though, is that while that sounds like it works in theory and it should be a good idea, the problem is that very few health insurance policies are actually being listed on these exchanges. Most are still just being offered through their employers. Uh, the insurance companies haven't wanted to comply with the rules of the healthcare exchanges, and so they simply have not even bothered putting their insurance policies on there. There are counties in the U.S. that have no policies on the exchange. 
None. Uh, here in Jackson County, North Carolina, there are like three policies, and they're all from the same company. So, like, how do I comparison shop if there's no policies on there? Right? So, it sounded like a great idea to help keep prices down, but just has not worked that well in effect. Now, since the Affordable Care Act has passed, health insurance costs have gone up a lot. Is that because of the Affordable Care Act? Some people say yes, some people say no. I think the act um, maybe made it a little bit more expensive, didn't work as well as I think it was hoped, as it was expected to. That said, the biggest problem with healthcare expenses in this country is not the Affordable Care Act, it's not the legal structure it's from the health care providers themselves. It's uh, the American Medical Association. It's the way the insurance companies interact and charge for things. Some studies have found that up to 30% of your medical bill comes just from figuring out who should pay what. So if you go and get an MRI and it costs $40,000, $12,000 of that, $12,000, just comes from figuring out who to charge how much. Okay, so I personally don't expect any bill from Congress or any act from any president to fix this in terms of like just changing the insurance market like the Affordable Care Act did. I don't expect that to be effective in any case. We need to fundamentally fix the way we charge for medical services. And that's a big problem, one we're not going to dive into here. Uh, I just want you to understand the nature of the health insurance industry, the market, where it's at, why it looks the way it does, so that as you start hearing it's an election year, when I'm recording this, 2020, as you hear people talk about health insurance and what's going on, uh, help you be a little bit more informed to make good decisions.